Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much um, for coming to this session, um, this open forum of the Freedom Online Coalition. Um, my name is Charles Bradley and I work at the support unit of the Freedom Online Coalition. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here um, to discuss a number of the key sort of priorities and focus areas of the FOC um, uh, within under the Ghana uh, chairmanship. Um, just as a little introduction, the Freedom Online Coalition is a network of 31 uh, member states who work collaboratively to promote and protect human rights online. Um, it was founded back in 2011 um, under the leadership of the US and Dutch um, as a way of coordinating efforts uh, within like-minded governments to ensure that uh, the, principles, um, of human, the principle of human rights offline apply online. And uh, since that date, has worked in a number of different ways to ensure that um, these rights are protected um, and that there is a strong uh, coordinate, coordinated effort between like-minded governments in multilateral forums and on in um, key spaces where norms are shaped. Um, in front of you, there are a couple of materials um, uh, which may be quite useful um, if you're unfamiliar with um, some of the detail of the FOC. Um, the first is the A4 document, which is the Programme of Action for 2019-2020, um, which really outlines the key priority areas um, for the FOC under the Ghanaian chairmanship. Um, and we're very lucky to um, uh, have um, uh, Dr. Albert from uh, Ghana today to talk about uh, the Ghana, Ghana's chairmanship and, and the upcoming conference, uh, which will take place uh, next year. Um, and the second document is um, uh, the um, very elaborately named Basic Documents um, Pack. Um, uh, this uh, provides um, uh, a, a sort of a, a a, a full list of all of the core documents of the FOC from the founding um, documents through to the current uh, Stockholm Terms of Reference, which is the sort of the constitutional document of the FOC, um, as well as um, as of the end of uh, 2018, all of the joint statements um, that the Freedom Online Coalition have made um, uh, collaboratively and, and by consensus um, over its time uh, of, uh, since forming in 2011. Um, so if there are any sort of questions on this, um, we, we can talk about those um, later, but we're very um, excited to be able to provide those and do hope that you'll share those with, with colleagues as well. Um, so the format of, of, of this open forum really is to talk through some of the key uh, priorities of the FOC um, under the chairmanship of Ghana. Um, we'll also talk about um, some work that the FOC is doing on the issue of disinformation and human rights, um, and also um, uh, on the advisory network, um, which is the multi-stakeholder body which advises um, the FOC. And to do so, I have um, uh, three panelists. Um, Albert, um, who's the uh, cybersecurity advisor um, uh, at the government of Ghana. Um, uh, Rauno, who's the uh, human rights ambassador um, in Finland. Um, and, and Mallory, who's the head of digital at Article 19, all have a deep connection with, with the FOC. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, hand over to Albert um, uh, to talk about the uh, Ghanaian chairmanship and upcoming activities. Uh, thank you, as usual, Charles, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, on behalf of my country, I think it's just appropriate to uh, recognize the great work you are doing, you and your team. Um, we have Mina here, but you've got a great team who have been supporting us uh, as we chair uh, this body. But also the friends of the chair. Um, I've seen all the hard work, the correspondence, the engagement, the advocacy that has gone on during this period, and I think we are really uh, happy for the support you've given us to, to run this. But it's important to congratulate uh, the government of Switzerland for joining the FOC. Uh, it happened during uh, our chairmanship, and, and we really appreciate that steps being taken. I also wish to report that we are having engagement with the government of Denmark, who has also expressed interest in joining uh, the FOC. Uh, as part of this, we are hosting the Danish Tech Ambassador in Ghana in December, uh, and we are going to discuss their membership of the FOC, and hopefully we can get them to announce this um, at a conference in February 2020. 
But permit me uh, also to commend and congratulate the government of Germany uh, for being selected as a champion by the United Nations on digital cooperation. Uh, I think uh, the German government deserved that. Uh, they have proven to be working as champions by bringing everybody on board, and I want to express my government support uh, for that kind of uh, responsibility, even at a global level. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I cannot talk much about the relevance of our work as a team, uh, specifically the mandate of the Air Force at this very crucial moment. Even when you look at the developed or the global north, there are a lot of changes going on. Um, there are changes relative to legislations to address emerging concerns in the cyber domain. When you also look at the global south, countries are actively taking up steps to introduce cyber security legislations uh, with the aim of addressing the various concerns that they have. I mean, this is a period that the work of the Air Force becomes, you know, very uh, critical. How do we achieve this? I've always stayed in a position of balance, and I don't know whether it's due to my background in philosophy. And the balance here is, as a body, we need to be mindful of whatever concerns that are necessitating the various legislations and support by way of our statement, advocacy, awareness creation to uh, support these countries to ensure that they follow a line that is consistent with the rule of law and the promotion of right in the digital space. I think my colleague Sam shared um, information that was sent out by the Twitter executive indicating the growth of our internet usage on the African continent. I also wish to add, if you look at the global internet statistics, um, the top countries with active presence on social media are in the, you know, the global south. Ghana is among the top 10 countries. Nigeria is there. Egypt is there. You know, it gives you certain insight that our citizens are actively online. This engagement are exposing them to a number of opportunities that they didn't have without technology. Indeed, I'm standing here, I mean, I'm speaking here also to argue that, for example, shutting down internet does not only impact on rights, as in you know, the traditional notion of right, it has a huge economic consequences for developing countries. Permit me to make that economic argument, because from the global south, there are a number of countries, including my own country, developing our country through digitalization, online banking. For Ghana has introduced uh, mobile money, financial interoperability, where transfer is done through mobile phones. And the volume of transactions that are recorded each day, should internet be shut down just for half a day, four hours, the country stand to lose a lot, even from the economic benefit. I think this should be part of our argument to um, raise awareness as to why we need to take the necessary steps to avoid taking certain extreme positions. But we can't just do that through advocacy. I've mentioned that. <coughs> My own interactions, there are certain governments who are really uh, committed to promoting rights. They know the benefit of the internet, and they know the responsibilities of guaranteeing the, the freedom of speech online. But sometimes they are challenged. And now permit me to share one typical example. Some of them, uh, for the abuse of internet or criminal use of the internet, sometimes they do not get any help. International cooperation sometimes fails them. The criminal use of, let's say, Facebook to perpetrate fraud. How do you get the right support through the legally accepted means. You know, for example, Ghana has gone through all these interrogations, and because we did not want to you know, subscribe to taking extreme measures that will have serious consequences, we had to ratify the Budapest Convention as a way 
of building collaborative effort by which the criminal justice system could use legally accepted mechanisms to address those issues. We ought to have a responsibility to give certain direction to certain countries. This is an alternative. If we speak out against shutting down the internet without providing alternative ways of reserve, resolving legitimate concerns, I don't think people will take us serious. And that is what I want to share uh, you know, with you as part of this. So we need to create awareness, we need to create incentives, but we need to also promote international cooperation arrangement that are consistent with the rule of law, that respect the right of citizens. And that is why I mentioned instruments like the Budapest Convention and so on and so forth. So that is just my introduction. Even though I was asked to market the upcoming event uh, in Ghana, which is confirmed, uh, I hope we can see everybody present here. We are building a very good program. Uh, we have confirmations, but we also want to uh, permit me to to wear my African hat, <laughs> just to be. We want to promote a lot of uh, awareness of the work of Air Force here among the African countries, especially in the ECOWAS region. In view of that, uh, I've gotten approval from my bosses. <laughs> the Air Force is an opportunity to extend invitation to all ambassadors, at least from ECOWAS countries, but also certain specific countries on the African continent so that they can come in and um, and, and, and have conversations, and, and through that, we'll be able to reach out to them to promote some of these ideals, which I believe is good for the world. Uh, Charles, I don't think I have much, but I prepared myself, that's why somebody is here, for the <laughs> questions. Uh, we look forward to make the event a very um, successful one. Our government is fully involved. My minister is aware. She's spoken about it. We were in Strasbourg together at the Octopus Conference. She announced that and she invited uh, people to join us. So we have a top government commitment and we look forward uh, to enrich your experiences when you visit us in Accra. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much and for, for showing great leadership on these issues in, in the region. It's going to be um, uh, fantastic to see this uh, come to uh, fruition um, in, the, in the conference, which I will plug is the um, 6th to the 7th of February um, in, in Accra. Um, and uh, more information of that will be available online shortly. Um, so thank you, um, Albert, um, for that. Um, I wanted to come um, next to uh, Rauno um, from, from the Finnish government um, uh, to talk about the issue of, of disinformation, which, the, as you'll see from the programme of action, the FOC has highlighted as one of its uh, priority areas uh, and um, uh, ask you to sort of talk to the issue and, and the importance of it from an FOC perspective. Thank you, Charles, and thank you, Albert. Um, and good Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Finland is one of the 31 member states of the Freedom Online Coalition. We have joined to the coalition uh, to, to promote the human rights online as they have, are respected offline. Um, and in recent circumstances, of course, we have to work together, not only the governments, but so also the, um, with, with civil society, business, academia, uh, to defend and promote the internet, which is open and trust for um, Because as we know, uh, this kind of internet is also challenged uh, in this world. One of the tasks the Freedom Online Coalition is doing is to, to shape uh, norms, legally non-binding non norms, soft law, if you wish. Um, and currently, Finland is drafting together with the United Kingdom the um, statement on disinformation and, and human rights. And this is because we, we are deeply concerned about the growing threat of both online and offline disinformation. Um, 
we understand this information as a, the de deliberate creation and this uh, emanation of information which is known to be false and with aim to cause harms for certain persons or for whole society. Uh, so this kind of information can erode uh, the trust in public information and democratic institutions. Uh, it may fracture community cohesion, polarize uh, societies, and in most extreme, extreme cases, incite hatred and, and, and violation. Uh, governments can do a lot to prevent disinformation and make a society more resilient against this, this information. Uh, pluralist free media is a starting point to build uh, resilience against disinformation. Other elements uh, of resilience are social cohesion, trust in institutions, high level education and adequate media and digital and media literacy. We have different ways to, to promote uh, human rights online uh, um, among the member states. In Finland, right to access to the to documents, public documents held by public authorities, is a constitutional right with certain very strict uh, restrictions. We have ratified the Council of Europe Convention on that particular issue and we encourage all participating states to sign and ratify the convention. Uh, we can also build a societal resilience against disinformation by fact-checking services. We have good experience of that. Um, and we need definitely open communication between uh, governments, uh, civil servants, politicians, civil society, school teachers, etc. Thus, any strategy to, co to counter disinformation should be multifaced. Uh, it should combine proactive governmental responses, education, and, and promotion of, of, of media and digital literacy, as, as well as pluralistic free media and responsible media companies. Uh, and all actions taken to prevent disinformation uh, have to be in line with human rights provisions, including freedom of expression and the right to access to information. We are quite far to, to draft the freedom of, of uh, on online coalition statement, but we still are happy and welcome if you like to comment this particular issue. Um, and we hope that you can, you can also uh, work together with us to implement uh, the, um, the activities um, to, for resilience and, and against disinformation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I think this issue, as you've so eloquently described, sort of shows the type of issue that the FOC is trying to um, grapple with um, and trying to uh, bring together um, uh, through consensus of all the members uh, some common positions and language, um, uh, including sort of definitional clarity, which is often sort of missing in, in many, of, many of these conversations and, and issues. So um, I know it's no mere feat to, uh, to get to where we already are with the statement, and we're hoping to have that as a, um, a public statement um, as a deliverable in the, in the coming months and definitely before the FO conference um, in Accra, of which we will um, uh, be sure to share and uh, widely, uh, widely publicize. Um, I just wanted to talk to one, one additional point on the sort of utility of, of the statement. Um, from, from your perspective, um, obviously it's a huge amount of time and energy taken uh, from, from your time and your government's time, as well as all the other um, participating governments as well. Um, what do you see as the main sort of utility of the statement and how would you sort of like to see it be used um, going forward? Um, I think that the, the common challenge for all governments in, within the uh, FOC and outside is to, to, to defend democracy and, and the public trust in, in democratic institutions. Then we have certain 
own um, own challenges or own own priorities. Um, in Finland, we have a geopolitical um, position where it's all utmost important to us to some way also to to be able to prevent the cross-border disinformation. Um, but mainly to us, this is a question that how to, how to foster democracy. Great, thank you very much. Um, and if at any point you have questions, or I, I know that many of the other member states are in the room, if you'd like to add in, please do um, put your hand up and um, try to get some conversation going in this sports hall um, would, be, would be great. Um, uh, I'd like to come back um, to Ghana. We're very pleased um, to um, have um, a, a member of parliament join us um, now and, and just uh, um, provide the floor for you to make your intervention. Thank you very much and um, a very good afternoon to the members of this session. Uh, my name is the Honourable Samuel Nate George, a member of parliament in Ghana and a member of the Parliamentary Select Committee on Communications that has oversight responsibility of the technology space. I believe that Ghana is one of the countries or leading lights in Africa when it comes to freedoms for people, be it in cyberspace or traditional media. We have recently, after 22 years, passed a rights to information bill that is supposed to give wider freedoms to access information. However, in the digital space, it's important for us to safeguard the rights of citizens. Uh, even though as governments and as legislators, we want to ensure that they're setting boundaries and guidelines that ensure that nobody is bullied, we also believe that the fundamental principle of the internet is a free internet and free expression by users of the platforms. And so Parliament of Ghana is committed. We've been working with Albert and the Ministry, Albert who is our National Cybersecurity Advisor, on putting in place proper frameworks, a cybersecurity uh, legislation that gives rooms and protects the rights and freedoms of our citizens to be able to express themselves and state their opinions. We, we have a very liberal legal system. We may not have the First Amendment as the United States may have, but our local jurisprudence has great respect for individual rights and liberties. About 20 years ago, we decriminalized libel. We repealed, we had what used to be called the criminal libel law, which the state could use to arrest, prosecute, and jail for comments that people felt were injurious to political personalities. We have repealed that. It's almost 20 years since that. I think that was repealed in 2001. And so um, on, an African, on the African continent where there's still a lot of stifling of free speech, Ghana is one shining example. And I'm happy to say that, I'm happy to you uh, for allowing us host the FOC conference next year because it's international recognition of the work that we are doing and it makes it easier for us to continue to champion further freedoms and be an example to the rest of the African continent. So um, all in all, we are comfortable and confident that we would continue to see a free internet space, uh, liberalization of the internet space, and we would continue to work with organizations like the FOC to see how well we can strengthen uh, internet freedoms in Ghana. There are one or two challenges that every country does have um, in, this world, in this era of hate speech and uh, violent extremism and terrorism and all of that. And so we're minded. We're minded by our responsibility as government and legislators to protect our citizens from all of this without necessarily infringing on their fundamental rights to expression. So I'm, I'm grateful to be part of this session and I'm sure that we can have further conversations on this matter. Thank you. Uh, Charles, just a comment because um, those of you who are familiar with the African contest, Honorable Sam George is a serving member of parliament with the opposition in, Brit in, in British political terms. Uh, I serve under the current government that means the party uh, that's in power. He is from the other side, called the opposition. But I just want to 
uh, highlight us to appreciate that when it comes to cyber related issues, uh, as a country that has achieved a tradition, uh, we have a common thinking, a common approach to things. And he gave you, as a member of parliament, historical background as to how all this development has happened. It's not because of party A or party B. I think it's a common vision of Ghana. Mm. And it's good to let you know that I represent the opinion of government in power. He, rep he is from the opposition, but we sing the same song when it comes to the right of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for, for participating. It's um, uh, been uh, too long that we haven't had uh, lawmakers and, and, and parliamentarians at uh, the IGF, um, so it's fantastic to have it's you well participate. Well, the speakers in Accra, so watch out. Yeah. He, uh, yeah. Very knowledgeable <laughs> in those areas, but please watch out this face when you are in Accra. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. And and just you know, as these issues become more complicated and and the sort of the national approaches to them become more legal, um, it's fa it's going to be ever more important to have um, your voice um, at the table uh, when we when we get to when we get to that. So thank you um, very much. Um, I have to note that unfortunately our panelist um, Rano has to leave for the airport, um, uh, which is very far away. Um, so unfortunately, but thank you very much, um, uh, Rano, uh, for for your participation today. Mallory, I'd like to come to you. Um, Mallory is one of the co-chairs of the advisory network, um, has been a um, long-standing um, uh, participant and engager uh, with the FOC, um, probably knows more about it than um, most people, including myself. Um, so I'd like to sort of pass it forward to you to, to, to make your intervention. Thank you. Thanks, Charles, and thanks <clears throat> to the previous speakers. It's important to remember that the Freedom Online Coalition is, is a member state um, coordinating group, um, but that it's always been committed to multi-stakeholderism. And that is why um, the advisory network exists and why um, I wanted to talk about this in the round table today, because it's very important. So I know that there are other advisors in the room. If you are an, on the advisory network for the FOC, could you just raise your hand? Some of you are not awake, that's fine. <laughs> um, and if you've been a part of a previous uh, working group of the FOC, can you also raise your hand? No? no? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. It's a few more people. So you've noticed, um, you know, there's actually the advisory, I would say the, the history of multi-stakeholder participation in the FOC is, goes beyond the advisory network in its history. So when it was first started, it was, um, there were not really formal mechanisms aside from the um, conference itself for participation, although I remember very well at my, um, at, the job, at my job at the time that we would regularly reach out to the Freedom Online Coalition to let them know that there was a topic that we felt they should write a statement on, and things like that. So that was the sort of early days of multi-stakeholder engagement, and then, they formed three working groups um, that were multi-stakeholder, so it was um, the member states as well as a nice balance of private sector and um, civil society and academic participation. They paid attention to things like gender balance um, and, and other intersectionalities on diversity. And it was, I think they, they all had mixed results over the few years that they um, that they were in existence, but it was a really great way to really, the idea was to build on a, a specific piece of work over a long period of time, which I think is almost the polar opposite of what the IGF is, where it's a multi-stakeholder space, but we have the event and then we go home, unless you're in intersessional work, and that's, that's really great work. Um, but, you know, the, the, those working groups were really meant to build trust and to build actual outputs, um, and that really led to, I think, a lot of great stuff. One of those, I was, full disclosure, I was on one of those working groups. It was the Internet Free and Secure Working Group 1, and there's even a website that still exists with all the products of that. You can go to freeandsecure.online. So that, that's, those are some really good products. There was also one on transparency um, and data protection, and then I think the other one was on surveillance. Uh, digital development. Digital development, thank you, sorry. <laughs> it was, they, they, they sunsetted in 2017, so it's been a while since I had to enumerate them. Um, so that's the sort of history. And then, you know, after they sunsetted the working groups in 2017, there was an establishment of the advisory network. And so that's the current model today. So both private sector, well, not both, private sector, civil society, and academic um, folks can join the advisory network that is um, 
it's a it's a fixed number at the moment, although there's no reason why it needs to be. Um, but I am the co-chair of that advisory network along with Bernard Shin from Microsoft at the moment. Um, and we're currently um, looking at you know changing some of the, the ways that the advisory network works and also renewing membership. So there are some folks who won't be continuing after a couple of years, and so we'll have open slots to fill. And you'll be hearing about that because we'll do a public call for applications. And we would really like for more more people, or even folks that were involved in previous work with the FOC, to consider um, coming back. And we really strive for balance so that we have um, private sector membership um, and not just civil society, and, and academics and researchers are also very, very welcome. And the reason why this is important, as you can see from the plan of action, there's a lot of really substantive and important statements that are done. And that's the sort of backbone or baseline, if you will, of what the FOC does is it comes out with statements. But it goes beyond that too. But if you just look at the topics that have been at, um, under discussion this year and are planned for next year, I think you'll see that there's a lot of room to bring your research, your perspectives, your advocacy um, uh, targets into those conversations. So one of the statements earlier this year was on Defending Civic Space, which I think was launched in May. There's a statement that's not yet launched yet, but has been um, hotly debated around digital divides, which is really an important, very, very important topic to get right. So it's okay that it's taken a while to, to do that. Um, there's also one on disinformation, which you just heard about. Um, and there's also a current debate around the um, cybersecurity laws and the human rights impact of cybersecurity that is obviously a really big topic if you've been at the IGF for the past few days, you will know that. <laughs> and then lastly, for next year, we're also planning on doing, um, or the governments rather, and we'll be advising on the um, a statement on artificial intelligence. So there's a lot of opportunities that covers a lot of issue ground in the internet freedom space. And mm -hmm. so it would be great if um, you can join us as part of the advisory network, but the other way you can get involved is just by coming to the to the ACRA conference. That's another great opportunity to talk to advisors and obviously um, FOC members um, and, and to be proactively engaged. Um, I would just say as a co-chair of the advisory network, I would be really happy to hear from um, people who want to engage and think that maybe the advisory network could do a better job of representing the larger space. Um, so proactively reach out to us. And I think it, based on our last meeting that we just had on Monday, in fact, our internal meeting, there was a really great idea that came from Emma Alonso of CDT to actually have our own sort of side meeting alongside the FOC conference in Accra as a way of be, doing a better job of, of communicating out and bringing feedback back into um, the FOC via the advisory network and trying to show better leadership on engaging people who are not in that limited fixed number of advisors at the moment. So that's, I think, my update and my plea to mm -hmm. continue to stay involved and to continue to raise important issues and your perspectives on those as part of the non-state stakeholders that care about the FOC. Thanks. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and I think that gives a really, really good picture of the evolution of the multi-stakeholderism of uh, the FOC, which is multilateral, as you, as, as you mentioned at the beginning. I think that the, the FOC went through a five-year strategic review um, back uh, in, in 2016 uh, through to 2018, um, and from an independent um, assessment, uh, which was carried out, as well as the in, internal conversations, it was really sort of underscored that the, the, the value was still this multilateral approach, that there was no other way um, existing mechanism for, the, for that engagement. And the FOC predates you know, the human rights discussion, really, at um, the IGF. It predates RightsCon. Um, it was created at a time where these things were very, very new. Um, and it had to sort of find its, its, its purpose again in, 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 that, in that conversation. Um, but what you touched on was some of the sort of really interesting value adds of, of that deeper connection, which is clearly a work in progress between the advisory network and the, and the, and the member states, um, which I wanted just to talk, to talk to a little bit more on, if that's okay. Um, <clears throat> As you mentioned, the cybersecurity statement is currently being um, um, developed. Um, this is an issue that um, many countries around the world do not have a shared position on. Um, then you add the complexity of uh, 30 other non-state actors who also 
don't potentially agree on, on that position, and we're trying to get to a, um, a consensus document. So 31 member states have to, have to um, uh, agree to that language. Um, we've sort of had an innovation in the, in the process to try and bring closer um, the, the advisory network inputs as well as, as, well as, the, me well as the member states. Um, I'd like just you to get your experience of, of that and, and, and how valuable that's been from, from someone who you know, is trying to shape this conversation from the outside and what the value of being you know, closer to some of the governments in the, the wordsmithing and redlining that's, that's currently, currently going on on that statement. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to talk more about that. So it's, it does sound like hard work, but I would say that there's a lot that's already been done because there is an existing statement or endorsement that the Freedom Online Coalition um, had released at the San Jose meeting in 2016 around the recommendations. Well, it was a definition, um, a sort of narrative of the complementarity of privacy and security, and um, a list of recommendations for cybersecurity policy making that respects human rights. And that was years of work, and it was hard. Um, the statement that we're working on right now is less ambitious and really leans on the work that was done previously. Um, and so it's hopefully um, just months long instead of years long process. But you're right that it's like the stakes are high given the larger, um, the larger conversation when there isn't a lot of alignment. But I think that's also why the Freedom Online Coalition's commitment to human rights is the highlight. You can't, you can't make a statement that says all the things or that you know, gets into the thornier issues that were, example, discussed this morning in the trust and norm session on, around like attribution and things like that. But if you just sort of, I think the Freedom Online Coalition has done a good job of recognizing what it is that it can contribute to that discussion, and it is around uh, sort of human rights-centric approach. And so it doesn't do too much, but that is a massive contribution, and I think is really guiding not just, hopefully, the, the interventions that Freedom Online Coalition member states are making in um, the UN processes in the First Committee, but also the engagement that the civil society and private sector um, stakeholders are making in their interventions into the process, because it's a little bit, it's a little bit more open this time. Yeah. So that's the hope. Um, and so definitely look out for that when it comes out. Hopefully it will be something we all agree on. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Um, just opening to the floor, are there uh, questions, comments, contributions um, uh, to, to the conversation? Courtney, please. Thanks. Um, it's good to hear that there's an interest in engaging with people who have not ever been able to formally be involved with the FOC, despite contributing a lot of time um, and organizational efforts. So I look forward to following up with you on that. But I have a question about some of the governments that are taking part in the FOC um, uh, you know, coalition, which is redundant, anyways. Um, and specifically, um, you know, many of those, and you mentioned that disinformation is a priority, but many of those governments are at the helm of disinformation campaigns and do not have electoral laws or you know, other regulatory frameworks for preventing political campaigns or um, government officials from conducting disinformation operations, online harassment campaigns, and other forms of computational propaganda. So where does that fit into the agenda? If there are member states that want to take that, I would be happy to give uh, my, our position, and then um, others can add in. That'd be great. Yeah. So, so the so the um, uh, the FOC, the, the, some of the process that goes into the actual development of the statements is to try and to ensure some of the coordination across the different agencies domestically, as well as some of the uh, competing sort of priorities um, that different agencies in different uh, countries um, have on some of these issues. Um, the FOC looks to, um, through its uh, founding documents and as well as the statements, you know, prov provide that sort of that standard and that bar that each of the member states are, are committed to both domestically as well as in their promotion of these values um, externally. And 
none of the governments are you know, perfect and there will always be some imperfections in some of these challenges um, and some of the um, uh, inconsistencies. Can, can we hear from the governments? Because I feel like you're just giving generic statements and I would like sure. to actually hear about whether or not sure. this is going to be on the agenda. And, you know, obviously no government is perfect, sure. but I've never heard anything about this. So I'd like to hear from sure. the governments whether this is going to be on I the agenda. I think Philippe would no like offense, to come Charles. in. Thank you. Of course, no offense taken. Thank you for the question. Uh, Philippe André Rodriguez from Canada, uh, one of the countries that has a regulatory framework for our elections, and we've just gone through an election, and the general feeling, uh, both from uh, the government but also from civil society, seems to be that there was very little, if any, disinformation during the campaign. So. Uh, I think in the context of the FOC, we are having that conversation uh, generally of, you know, when the FOC was founded, the questions that it was tackling uh, were relatively narrow. Um, this space was relatively uh, narrow and increasingly we see a lot of different issues, uh, including disinformation being um, having been discussed. And so I think we are currently thinking about how to address these issues of, well, when governments may not be entirely um, acting uh, in line with, um, with the commitments uh, that, they, that they have made in the context of the FOC. So this is an ongoing process of where are we going with this piece. Um, there was a bit of a of a spark, spark plug there, uh, given that, um, I, as you may be aware, uh, the Global Internet Forum for Countering Terrorism um, was relaunched uh, at the last uh, UN General Assembly with the added, uh, one of the added elements there was that um, in our, uh, essentially countries can now become advisory, uh, part of the advisory body of that organization. And in order to be part of that body, you need to be part of the FOC. So this kind of uh, ignited the conversation around how do we keep governments accountable for the commitments that they have made under uh, the FOC. Uh, so there's a process right now. Um, it's still very much at, at its preliminary, preliminary stages, so we'll see where that goes. But at least um, there is a conversation that has been ignited. And actually, you know, uh, talking about the role of the advisory network, I think this is something that that the advisory network has been very vocal that we have that conversation a little bit more openly uh, in terms of that process. So uh, something to keep uh, an eye on in the, in the next little while. Thanks. Thank you very much. And we can take specific questions. I'll take that offline if you want to, on, on the statement and the specific scope as well. I think that's a really, really important point. Thank you, Courtney. One um, sort of part of the FOC that uh, sometimes gets missed off um, is uh, the Digital Defenders Partnership. Um, so I wanted to come to Frederica. Um, the FOC sort of gave birth uh, to this great initiative um, uh, uh, with, with some of the um, governments as, as leaders and for a long time um, the main contributors to it. But it'd be great to get a sort of an update of where you're at and your, your new strategic vision and, and, and what's going on there. Hi. Yeah, thank you. So, exciting news. We just launched our new strategy document, basically. Our, um, uh, yeah, the, the initiative was started in to end 2012 by several FOC governments, but we're quite... Yeah, are we part of the FOC or not? We're always something like in between. We're new, neutral basically from the governments that we're working with and we're an ally to them working with different embassies. And what we do is protecting human rights defenders uh, who are under digital, digital attack and providing a holistic response to them. And um, what is new and exciting in our strategy is one of the things we're seeing now on the ground is that there is not enough um, local capacity available to provide this holistic response. So we're field building at the moment. And where are we at? We're basically fundraising for, can I say that here? Fundraising for this new strategy paper. And at the moment, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Finland are contributing. Uh, but we have been supported by seven FOC members. So um, um, please come to me if you're interested um, in this new strategy document, and I'm happy to explain more later. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Any other questions, thoughts? 
Yes, please. Okay. Um, I'm just going to make a comment which I think the FOC as a body should begin to look at more extensively, and it spans from the point that was made by uh, the lady over there. It has to do with the issue of disinformation and a centralized, harmonized position by the FOC. Because when you look on the African continent, and I, I always try to put things in, within the perspective of Africa, because in most of the sessions I've sat through here at the IGF this year, I've realized that most of the th discussions are, ethno uh, are Eurocentric and North American oriented, and very, very light on Africa and maybe Asia or the developing world. But when you look at Africa and elections and the issues of disinformation, misinformation, and fake news, these are very key things. And I'm glad that Ghana is going to be hosting the FOC next year because we have an election next year. It would be fantastic if we could begin to build a certain framework under the auspices of the FOC that will guide countries that may not have the law as Canada has on electoral guiding electoral processes that will help as legislation, benchmarks that local legislation can span out from that would help to control misinformation, disinformation, and fake news. Because one of the biggest challenges to freedoms of online users is when governments think that there's a lot of disinformation or misinformation. And so the, the natural reaction of power or, or governments is legislation. It's what you saw even here in Germany. I mean, the Network Enforcement Act is basically a response to social media content. And so if, we're, if, if the FOC can champion some study that gives us a certain framework, a benchmark that governments can then localize into local legislation, I think this is something that will go a long way if, if there's a real study done on it that helps us to build that framework that enables us to handle the problems and challenges of disinformation, misinformation, and, and fake news. Because take it from me, no, I don't think governments on their own just want to clamp down on, 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 on free speech. But if you're left without any framework to guide you, uh, when you see government officials, and, and, and disinformation is not just by government propaganda. Opposition propaganda against government is also equally big. You get it. And, and so it, it cuts both ways. Um, like Albert told you, he, he represents the government of Ghana's perspective. I represent the opposition and the largest opposition in Ghana's perspective. I would be playing the ostrich to assume or suggest that disinformation in my country is one-sided. In fact, there's an ongoing battle from both sides. And it's simply because there's no legislation that seems to control that space. It's, it's an open space. And so if you're not careful and you have somebody sitting in the Ministry of Communication or in government that decides, look, we can't just have a free-for-all battle, what you're going to see is a legislation that may end up inhibiting the freedoms of users on the internet. So the FOC should take this as, a, as something serious that you may want to explore. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and some of the some of the challenges we're seeing definitely are those sort of legislative and policy proposals to, to stop fake news, but definitely sort of encroach on the rights to free expression and privacy. Would you like to come in? Thanks, Hannah. Yeah. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hannah Mujemi. I'm part of the advisory network, and um, I stress, you know, the need to have parliamentarians like yourself to come to these meetings so we can have um, an open channel to discuss all these issues. And I think um, there is a massive gap, you know, in, um, in a space like the IGF where the um, policymakers, you know, the people who are calling all the shots and making legislation are not present in this space. And it would be good if, you know, you act as an agent of change and go back to your local context and then inform people about this um, importance of forum and I'm looking forward the um, opportunity you know to uh, come to Ghana so we can engage more you know with people um, during the upcoming AFOC um, I think there is no easy way to do this because so many governments we have 55 governments in Africa and it will be um, you know a dream to think that we can convince them all um, uh, about the principles of the AFOC so I think 
if you took that challenge upon your shoulder, you know, to be the ambassador, you know, of the African countries in the continent, I think this is a huge challenge and it's probably, uh, you know, nice to find allies, you know, in your local or regional context, um, knowing that Africa is already kind of, not divided, but there are specificities, you know, according to the region, there is the, the language barrier as well, and I think this is definitely a good start, you know, to, um, to start the conversation, and I really uh, encourage, you know, the, the integration, you know, of the uh, legislative, you know, part of um, the governments to be, um, you know, part of these conversations. Spanning from um, the, the last comment, I, I don't know what, how this sits with you, but like I always say, um, I speak from the African context and I speak about my country, Ghana, because that's where I can speak off with authority and what happens. I believe that one of the key things that you could do to reach out to Africa is to make a case with Ghana. Because a lot of countries on the African continent look up to Ghana when, as a gold standard when it comes to legislation, when it comes to issues of cybersecurity and the internet and freedoms. If the FOC is going to be in Ghana in, in February, I would want to suggest to you to consider actively a direct engagement with the Parliament of Ghana, specifically the Select Committee on Communications. It's something that I can work with Albert to facilitate, at least a visit where the FOC gets the opportunity to interact directly with the Parliament of Ghana and use that as a case study to show how this can work on the African continent. And then it becomes easy for you to replicate it across the, the continent. When people see that, okay, this is possible, it's happened in Ghana, West Africa is going to follow. Once it happens in West Africa, it's easy for North Africa, East Africa, and Central Africa to come on board. So uh, let me say that this is an unofficial invitation to the FOC by the Parliament of Ghana, the Select Committee on Communications. I think Albert can officially accept the unofficial um, invitation. <laughs> no, uh, no but you are away. No, he is my boss in terms of parliamentary oversight. And we cannot say no. So we take it in good faith, honorable. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Well, I think that brings us nearly to time. And if any session ends early, you always get brownie points. So I'm going to try and get us in before, uh, uh, before the end of four o'clock. So thank you so much for taking the time to uh, come to this um, open forum of the Freedom Online Coalition. Um, a couple of uh, final things just to, just to um, uh, put a fine point on it. The conference is taking place on the 6th to 7th of February in Accra, and you're all welcome uh, to join us there. Uh, more information will be available, but please follow um, the FOC on Twitter um, for that. Um, uh, all the information that has been provided in hard copy, as well as a wealth of other information about the FOC is available on the FOC website, which is Freedom Online Coalition. Com. The great work of Working Group 1 is also available online at freeandsecure.online. Um, good to use those new GLTDs, very good. Um, and there'll be a public call uh, for new advisory network members um, coming out shortly, um, and the advisory network um, will be um, leading that process and, and working with others to ensure that the, um, there's sort of deep engagement with external stakeholders with the FOC going forward. So thank you very much. Um, enjoy the rest of your IGF um, and hope to see you in sunny Accra. Thank you.
pas, j'en ai là. Parfait. 